So today, I'm very pleased to be able to, um, we'll have the opportunity to hear from two of our scientists who are going to share their work with you. First, I'd like to welcome and ask to come to the stage, Megan Insko. Megan is the William Ravis Charitable Fund Fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, as Alan mentioned, we have, through the, the generous support of William Ravis and the William Ravis Charitable Fund, been able to support 16 scientists over the past four years, and Megan is the recipient um, of one of those awards. Megan is a physician scientist um, who works in the lab at Boston Children's Hospital, but also sees patients at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Megan? Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So I want to start by saying when I was 15, my mother died of breast cancer. And at that time, I committed myself to making a difference in the lives of cancer patients and their families. Today, seeing melanoma patients, which is a type of skin cancer, seeing melanoma patients at uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, I'm continually reminded of the work we still have to do. My research has been productive, yielding several important findings with implications for patients that I'll share with you in a moment. And I can say with great confidence that support from Damon Runyon has contributed meaningfully to the progress of my work. Unlike most other sources of support that are accessible to physician scientists in the formative stages of their careers, Damon Runyon's postdoctoral fellowship funding lasts for four years. This long-term support empowers me to focus on caring for my patients and finding new therapies rather than searching for new funding. Thank you so much to William Ravis and Damon Runyon for this incredible support, which has made my research progress possible. So I think uh, we can, oh, there we go, sorry. Okay, so my research involves gene expression in melanoma. So first I need to define gene expression. So from the time you were a, a one cell stage embryo or a tiny baby until as you are now as an adult, all the cells in your body have the same DNA. However, a neuron in your brain and a myocyte in your heart are not the same, right? They're extremely different. Those tissues are very different, even though they have the same DNA. So a lot of these changes or differences between the tissues can be explained by something called gene expression. This is the expression of RNA from DNA and from proteins from RNA. So I study melanoma, which you can on the right there, which is a, the most lethal kind of skin cancer. And uh, the incidence is rising and we really need more therapies for this disease. Melanoma is, a, is derived from melanocytes, which are pigment producing cells, which normally protect our skin from sun damage. However, melanoma is particularly good at co-opting or hijacking gene expression programs from other tissues or even from earlier in development uh, to and takes advantage of these gene expression changes to grow and be aggressive. There are no gene expression inhibitors, um, FDA approved in melanoma right now, but there are for other cancers. So I found this a really interesting area and an intriguing therapeutic avenue for melanoma. So I studied melanoma using a model organism, the zebra fish, where I can test hypotheses that are generated from human data. Zebrafish are an excellent model for melanoma. So zebrafish have melanocytes in their skin, just like we do, that make their pigmentation patterns and protect them from the sun. And in fact, the stripes in a zebrafish are made up of those very melanocytes. Zebrafish, like humans, can get melanoma, and the genetics are remarkably similar. So we can put most human proteins into zebrafish and study exactly what they do. So I found, using the zebrafish and human data that there's a gene called CDK13, and this is an enzyme that affects gene expression, the process I explained earlier. When this is mutated, my zebrafish, this is what a control zebrafish looks like. And when I mutate CDK13 in these zebrafish, I get a very aggressive form of melanoma. You can even see early melanomas on these zebrafish. In human patient data, this is also the case. So on the horizontal axis, you'll see the months, and on the vertical axis, you see overall survival. So for patients that have mutations in CDK13 or less expression of CDK13, these patients are not 
living as long because their melanoma is coming back and taking their lives. Together, these data indicate that this is a new high-risk melanoma subset and has many implications for patient care. So now I want to thank Damon Rungan again because this initial observation is important, but because of Damon Rungan's funding, I've taken two years to figure out mechanistically and biochemically how this works. And now I'm going to show you a cartoon demonstrating two years of experiments. <laughs> Oh, sorry, there's the blue line. I'm not good at the clicker. So normally CDK13, I should say that the black line is DNA, and this blue line is RNA, which is gene expression. And normally CDK13 binds the enzyme that makes RNA from DNA, and that proceeds normally all the way down a gene. Sometimes, because this is such a complex process, that actually doesn't work, and the RNA actually stops a little bit early. It's terminated early, and these are kind of like junk RNAs, and it turns out that our cells, when they're healthy, have a really good way through this PAX complex of recognizing these junk RNAs, and CDK13's job is to chemically modify the PAX complex, which recruits some more um, proteins, which are responsible for degrading these aberrant RNAs, and getting rid of the junk or recycling them, you might say. When CDK13 is mutated, and in the situation where you get these short, prematurely terminated RNAs, they're still recognized by the PAX complex. However, CDK13 can no longer activate the recognition of these and recruit the machinery that actually recycles them. So you get this huge like buildup of junk in the cell, like these short RNAs. And these actually get turned into short proteins and cause huge problems for the cell. And I now know that they cause more lethal melanoma. And interestingly, there's also a developmental disorder with patients that harbor the same exact mutations. And my research has insight for these developmental patients as well. So now I just want to tell you some implications from patients that come from my work. There's really three at this time. One is because CDK13 mutant melanoma patients make these short RNAs and short proteins, this really begs the question whether there may be some new proteins made or abnormal ones that might be recognized by the immune system. These patients might be, and we have some preliminary data suggesting they may be more responsive to immunotherapy. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how to go back. <laughs> But, <laughs> but this, the second point is because this is such an aggressive melanoma subtype that we really should be testing melanoma patients with early stage melanomas for this mutation because they would need better monitoring, more careful monitoring, and possibly they should be studied for curative therapies in the early stages. And lastly, patients with this developmental disorder should be screened for melanoma very carefully. So with that, I want to thank you so much for the funding and the chance to speak today. Thank you.